first of all, ma'am, could you just uh, please give brief, briefly introduce yourself to our viewers so that you know everyone gets an idea? Like a, sh a brief introduction. Okay. I would really appreciate that. Uh, my name is Liz Thompson. Um, in 2010, I was recruited by the United Nations as an Assistant Secretary General with specific responsibility for, um, as one of the two executive coordinators of the Rio Plus 20 Conference on Sustainable Development, which took place uh, in June of this year. Um, as part of that effort, I developed uh, the Higher Education Sustainability Initiative, um, and that's what brought me to WISE, actually. Perfect. So actually, ma'am, I'm actually studying, researching on sustainability in, you know, the Gulf Monarchies, sustainability in education city. So one of the questions that I wanted to ask you, which is a part of my, uh, part of the, the project that I'm involved in, is how do we, because as a policymaker, you have like uh, formulated policy, environmental policy, uh, as the minim, uh, you were the minister, uh, you, you were the minister for West Indies uh, regarding environment, uh, regarding the environment. Uh, so I wanted to ask you, how do you ensure that, you know, uh, these green sustainable awareness, sustainable awareness and environmental awareness diffuses throughout, you know, Qatari, uh, throughout society, as opposed to, you know, it being restricted to one or two elitist, elite centers. Because one could argue that this, what we have over here in Doha, one could interpret this as, you know, as one center. And, you know, how do we ensure that, you know, this diffuses on it? to the 97, 98% of the people out there. If you could, you know, so the essence of what I'm trying to ask is how do you get the message across? Well, you don't ask about six questions. <laughs> I think that what you have to do is to think about engaging a society. How do you engage a society? You start by teaching children a specific set of core values here in Qatar, from very early, um, family values would be taught to children. Uh, they're, they're taught about their faith, they orient themselves toward Islam. You have to think of orienting children toward environmental sustainability and toward Qatari sustainability. How does one grow a society? How does one grow an economy? How do you locate Qataris in the rest of the world? Now, if you are teaching sustainability, therefore, what would be the important groups in the society that you have to reach? The business sector, um, housewives and homemakers, mothers, because they bring children up, uh, university and educational institutions generally. So you determine who your stakeholders are, who are the ones who are going to be carrying your messages and then what kinds of messages do you need to frame for specific audiences to get them to buy in to, to the message and to affect change in their attitudes. Um, who do you, regarding education and emergency situations, who do you think should take uh, the lead in, uh, in uh, trying to provide uh, education and, and uh, in emergency situations? Is it, is it the United Nations? Is it individual countries? Is it grassroots organizations? What do you think? The answer think? is all of the above. Um, look, it, as, a, as a global family, all of us have areas of responsibility. The United Nations does have a supportive role to play, but a, every government has a responsibility to its citizens, and citizens have to hold their governments to account. Grassroots organizations are often operating at the coal face, on the ground, in the community, face to face with the citizen. So each, each organization, each entity, the grassroots organization, the United Nations, the government, can play a very important role, but there are different kinds of rules and they come together uh, to, to, to make education happen, even in an emergency, situa emergency situation. Countries coming out of emergencies, countries coming out of conflict, need educated citizens in order to be able to grow, to have peace and stability, to give uh, opportunities for upward mobility to citizens, and therefore you cannot 
ever um, let loose the reins or let go of the reins in relation to education or your healthcare systems because they are the core of your investment in human and social capital. So, uh, I mean, part of uh, that ties into multi-stakeholders, you know, uh, in your part of promoting education, uh, because as, the, you know, a representative of uh, the UN, which one could argue is one of the uh, partners in, uh, one of the stakeholders in education, what are some of the initiatives that, you know, the UN in itself, uh, the, the, that the United Nations is taking to promote education uh, in, a, uh, in a, as, uh, at present? Because one, uh, you know, the, the Millennium Development Goals are, you know, coming to a close. Uh, 2015 is approaching. Where do you see? Uh, where do you think that you know you stand from the time when you know the MDGs were formulated? Okay, I think that there are three answers to that. First of all, the United Nations and its member states are already engaged in a dialogue on the Sustainable Development Goals, which are likely to be the new policy framework, which will complement and replace, um, I think, eventually the Millennium Development Goals. Um, second, the Secretary General has launched a new initiative, which he's calling Education First, uh, which speaks to the paramountcy of education in all circumstances. And third, the Higher Education Sustainability Initiative, which, as you know, is targeted at greening universities and business schools and uh, getting them to teach uh, sustainable development as a core module across all disciplines. And there are already uh, in excess of 300 um, universities who, which have signed on to the Higher Education Sustainability Initiative in over 50 countries. And it, it is gathering momentum. So I think that these are some of the initiatives that the UN at the international level is promoting and trying to reach various stakeholders in the education system at, at various levels. We talk, last question ma'am, uh, we talk about innovation and uh, education, but the question to you, how can we provide innovative education in emergency situations and also how can we make sure that it is sustainable? That's so much easier than you might think and I'll tell you why. Um, when violence broke out after the Iranian elections, when uh, what is popularly referred to now as the Arab Spring um, took place, when the Occupy Wall Street and other places movement started, it became popular through modern technology, through the use of the cell phone. And that is the greatest mechanism for giving education to people all over the world. Because even where people do not have computers, even where people do not have radios, even where people do not have modern communication systems, people are using their cell phones. They're using their cell phones to transfer money from one country to another or from one location to another. They're using their cell phones to browse and access information to see what is happening across the world in real time. So that we really need to use gamification, we need to use um, cell phones more for passing on information, for passing on learning, for keeping people in touch and um, continuing the education process, even where there are in emergency situations. And scientists are increasingly arguing that this is the era of what they're calling the Anthropocene, where um, man's capacity to impact his um, the natural and built environment has become so advanced because of technology that he can now do irreparable harm. But people don't understand and can't understand that relationship with the environment and how important it is to uh, social stability, to social well-being, to economic growth, um, unless they're told and taught about it. And gaming and um, the, the cell phone and the modern technology is a wonderful mechanism for reaching everybody everywhere, even in emergencies. Thank you very You're much welcome. for your time, ma'am. You're welcome. Yeah, I just have a couple quick questions. Yes. Um, okay, so one of the things I always hear about in these conferences is 
that today's education is not relevant to today's technologies and that type of thing. Um, and so the one thing I don't hear much is that uh, a university education, for example, um, opens somebody's mind up. It, it offers them critical insights, it develops their critical capacity, problem solving abilities, those kind of things. And I just wanted to uh, get a sense of your thoughts around that. I think that because universities, schools are large bureaucracies run by even larger bureaucracies called ministries, um, you know, they, they, they plan a curriculum, a teaching cycle, it's 10 years, it's this, it's that, where with technology the changes are happening so rapidly. I'm amazed that it takes me forever to pick up my cell phone and figure things out and a child that's 12 years old takes it from me and looks at me like, okay, this one is clearly very daft and, and, and you know, does it in minutes. And really, the, the, what education now has to become is a rapid response system relative to um, what is happening with the technology and moving learning on an, um, an e-platform or a virtual platform. It's very, very difficult to do because how do you uh, change your curriculum so rapidly? How do you embed the technology in your teaching systems? And in developing countries, the challenge, or a, a very um, significant part of the challenge, is the cost of technology. Com uh, a computer is becoming obsolete, what's it, every six months or every 12 months they bring out a new model, a new tablet. Uh, you know, a new, a new Android, uh, we're already, I think, at third generation Androids, etc. So, how can education systems keep up? It really is a very difficult, very, very complex, very difficult issue. But I think that we do have to embrace the technology, certainly to reach people who can't get into physical universities and who cannot get into uh, classrooms and physical structures have to take education to them but uh, education also has to become rapid response and, and move in the way that the technology is moving. I don't know that I have the answer. <laughs> okay. uh, last question that I have is just around adult education, adult and senior education because again a lot of the things that are discussed in conferences like these are how do we um, make our youth better? Uh, but how about the adults and the, the seniors that we have right now? Uh, what kind of education uh, uh, initiatives does the UN approach for them? Well, the, the UN is uh, embraces education in its broadest sense, and um, we, we believe in reaching uh, the adults through classrooms where possible, but certainly through the technology, the e-platforms that are available. We also think it is very important to try to affect social change through um, information and education and training. So that, that is something that uh, we strongly support. But the focus has always been, after a while people are interested in earning and not in learning necessarily. Um, I don't know what percentage of people who do degrees, um, bachelor's degrees, and, and don't complete a doctorate, let's say by age 30 or 35, will go on to do a doctorate after that because by then they're raising a family, they're having kids, um, you know, they're, they're settled in the workplace, it's hard to get the time off. And so that's why the focus is on young people. And second, it is always, if we are to grow as a human family, and if we are to be able to grow our societies and economies, the best way to do that is through our young people. And so the, the investment in education for youth really represents an investment in the future of, the, of your society, of your country, and in, in, the, in a global future. And that's why the emphasis is always on young people, to get them to be a better generation than we were. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.